Uh, well, welcome everybody. It's terrific to see you all this morning on a colder than we expected April with, I gather, some uh, rush hour complications. Uh, so the fact that people made it here uh, is all the more meaningful and we're really appreciative to, to see everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you to this wonderful partnership that we, the Miller Center, are doing today with the Committee for Responsible Federal uh, Budget. Um, this has been a great partnership that we started probably about six months ago or eight months ago in talking about this and really delighted to uh, have Maya and her colleagues with us today. Um, we're going to show a, a short video describing the first year project. For those of you that don't know it, I'll talk for just a minute or two and then hand it over to, to, uh, to Maya and then we'll, we'll turn to the panel. So uh, if we can start the video. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. To pledge to each other all that is best in our lives, all that gives meaning to them for the sake of this, our beloved and blessed land. All are equal, all are free, and all deserve a chance to pursue their full measure of happiness. There is tremendous momentum coming off an election. The American people have spoken. Congress is at its most receptive. Federal workers await a new direction. Our next president must harness this goodwill or risk squandering the nation's best opportunity to break the gridlock, an opportunity that only arises once every four years. And the clock starts running on day one. So why is the first year so important? Past administrations have learned the hard way that Washington slows down after the new president's first year in office. Congressional elections begin to dominate Capitol Hill. Bipartisan goodwill morphs into discord. The American people who expect results become disillusioned and turn away. To break this cycle, time is of the essence. A successful president will hit certain marks during the first year, choose a cabinet, confirm department deputies, set an agenda, and get it done. History shows that successful presidents learn to balance the competing demands of politics and management. Politically, the president must choose. Does he or she pursue the agenda that energized the party faithful? Or does the president embrace the pragmatic concerns of centrists in both parties? And then there is management, understanding the scale of the federal government. Two and a half million civilians and more than a million in uniform who serve Uncle Sam at home and around the world. Latest Fox polls find 65% of Americans say the government is broken. Decade Continuing of pessimism. Continuing deep pessimism divided, across this trouble, country. Deteriorating. Today, a vast majority of Americans believe our system is broken. America's next president will take over this political apparatus and immediately attempt to get the wheels of government turning again. Head of state and party leader, the president who synchronizes these dual roles in the first year can restore movement and function to a modern American government. Guided by lessons of the past, he or she leads the country forward once again towards a more perfect union, a more perfect new order for the ages. So in this video, we try to capture uh, what is the essence of today's discussion or at the core of today's discussion about the federal budget, which uh, uniquely brings together the management and the politics and the broader priority themes of an incoming administration. As with the rest of the first year project, which is a series of, um, think about them as, uh, as an online magazine, a series of editions uh, where we've released essays in the past on just thinking about how a president manages his or her first year, how they manage the national security challenges of a first year, including the inevitable first year crisis, 
and in the future we'll have essays on how to navigate Congress, um, how to think about middle class uh, goals and, and, um, and values, how to think about presidential communications. This set of essays that, uh, that we'll be talking about today are on the first budget, both looking backward at how previous presidents have managed uh, that first budget and looking forward, what are the challenges that the next president will face. And we have a terrific partner in this effort, which is the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, headed up by and founded by Maya McGinnis, um, who uh, I've had the pleasure of working with in the past, where she was a, a fellow at Brookings and worked closely with Brookings over the years. Um, and so I want to turn it to Maya to, to welcome us. And, and Maya will also be on our second panel today. Morning. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Um, we're really pleased to be partnering with Bill and the Miller Center, though I, I just had a fleeting thought right there when I was standing there that I might look like Chris Christie standing next to Donald Trump. I said, <laughs> Never stand next to a podium in this new age. It was a little odd. Um, anyhow, I just briefly want to welcome everybody. I think we have a great set of discussants today, two of my favorite former directors of OMB and also board members. Um, and this has been a really nice partnership because while the Miller Center was focusing on the first year, we at the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget had launched a project called First Budget, uh, coming up with the same thing, that it's so important how a president really sets the president's very on in their, in their tenure. And so we were running a project that was working in Iowa and New Hampshire on the ground, talking with presidential candidates and emphasizing how important it is what they talk about during the campaign and what they put in their first budget. And if you look back over the past, you see that the first budgets of past presidents, presidents have been very, very important and instructive in laying out what their agenda for their full four or eight years has been. So it's been really an elegant um, and complimentary partnership. We're excited about this program today, and I'm going to turn it back to Bill to introduce our first panel. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Well, thank you, Maya. And I'm now, since the theme is budgets and numbers, I'm going to introduce our moderator, uh, the voice of the Miller Center, as you heard on the video, with a series of numbers. Uh, 41 years, that's how long she covered the White House. She left on the 41st anniversary of the first day she began covering it during the Ford administration. Uh, 50 states, uh, she's traveled to all of them in this job. Uh, six countries, six Hall of Fames in uh, Six continents, got it, six more, uh, clearly more than six countries, six continents, I can't read my own handwriting. Thank you, Ann. Uh, six Hall of Fames, Air Force One on 9-11. Uh, she was there in Florida and then was the pool reporter, I guess, uh, uh, that stayed with the president on that day. Um, 37 years married, and in those 37 years married, her single biggest accomplishment was 12 down, which was when she showed her husband that she had made the New York Times crossword puzzle, and he was, for the first time, impressed uh, uh, with Anne. And with that, uh, I turn it over to Anne Compton, who is not just on the governing council of the Miller Center, but is also on the advisory council for this project. Uh, the advisory council itself, I think, speaks to not just the intellectual ambitions, but the impact ambitions of the project. We've assembled a terrific group of bipartisan and nonpartisan uh, uh, advisors for the project, former administration officials from both Democratic and Republican White Houses, as well as um, Ann and, and Jim Lehrer, and a series of other uh, supporters of the project who are helping us make sure that the kinds of things that we discuss here are not just uh, interesting intellectual conversations, but have impact on the next administration. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anne. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, very much. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see so many familiar faces here. There are about a dozen seats still up here. So those of you in the back, please feel free to move forward. On either side, there are plenty of seats left. Uh, today, our focus, what, can, what do we know about how budgets were done that first year of critical administrations that we could pass on in terms of advice to uh, the whoever is the incoming president and the incoming budget director. And uh, we have as a panelist today, Alice Rivlin, who I think I call the first lady, uh, Washington's first lady of uh, budgeting. 
she, nobody in Washington has seen the process from so many different angles. Not only the founder of the Congressional Budget Office, but then later joining uh, under the um, Clinton administration, the, uh, the Budget Office in the White House, uh, becoming its director. She even went to the Federal Reserve Board, was uh, vice chairman there. Uh, she has been, of course, at Brookings a long, long time, and she brings to Washington and has represented in Washington uh, really one of those serious voices that people listen to because of her depth of her wisdom and her uh, intellect. Mitch Daniels is here. Uh, he has been president twice, currently of Purdue University for the last three plus years also uh, president of the Hudson Institute. He's never been president of the United States to the disappointment of some Republicans over the years. And even some of his critics say he has been, he was an exemplary governor, two-term governor of Indiana. Uh, but he was uh, chosen, he agreed to leave uh, Eli Lilly and uh, his, his life back in Indiana to come back to Washington when George W. Bush appointed him uh, as his first budget director. And George W. Bush loved giving lots of us nicknames in the administration, uh, his friends and sometimes his enemies. But his nickname for Mitch Daniels was The Blade <laughs> for budget cutting. Um, starting uh, with you, Ms. Rivlin, uh, no, I'm going to start with Mitch Daniels because in 2001, when you walked into the budget director's office, a beautiful office right across the driveway from the West Wing, you had a $200 billion budget surplus and a whole new administration. What happened that first year, 2001, with the budget? What's well, all? Sorry about that. Try that again. It's all a blur. <laughs> it didn't dawn on me, Ann, until I was waiting out front. It was in this building that I got the phone call. I was here on business. I was staying in a room upstairs. December the something of 2000 when they finally, the last hanging Chad fell, or when they finally all knew who won the election and I got a phone call that night and uh, uh, life began changing and hasn't stopped. Um, and uh, so the first thing that's salient about that was that that transition was maybe half as long as it's supposed to be. And um, uh, I, I did uh, agree to take what I think is the most interesting job in the federal government. And uh, 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 came here, and our assignment was to put together that first budget in, in, at warp speed. Um, didn't know anybody. Assembled what I think was just a tremendous crew of people, but uh, none of us knew each other, or I didn't know any of them before it started. It's a little hard to remember exactly what happened, but I will, I'll, I'll, the, with the perspective of the time, I mean, two things that uh, anybody walking into a new administration, particularly that job, I think ought to bear in mind. Uh, first of all, um, uh, don't trust anybody's numbers. So you see what happened was, uh, the answer is there was a surplus and it lasted one year, but it was all illusory because it was based on projections of economic growth that weren't happening going to happen. I remember that Vice President to be Cheney in December of 2000 said, I think we're on the cusp of a recession. He got filleted in the press and so forth. And it turned out he was exactly right. And when the arbiters looked back, they dated the recession to about the fourth quarter of 2000 or somewhere in there. And so uh, one thing you learn very quickly is that, that uh, the assumptions that undergird any of these budgets, is, it's, it's incredibly sensitive to even minor changes in the environment. You know, to take one of today's best examples, if the Fed wasn't jamming interest rates down to historically unbelievable levels and keeping them there, the deficit would be much, much bigger. It's like a trillion dollars a percent over 10 years. So one thing you learned very quickly was that that the, uh, you have to be very, very cautious about the numbers. And frankly, that's fine because budgets, as is occasionally mentioned, as occasionally pointed out, uh, certainly first budget, are expressions of priority. And we ought to pay a lot more attention to the, the, the sense of what's more and less important to that new administration, that new chief executive, 
and not obsess so much about, you know, whether this is projected to go up 3% or 5% because it's almost certainly going to be wrong. Alice Rivlin, uh, you were in the budget office. Uh, where did the uh, Bush administration get that surplus, and was it illusory? No, it wasn't, but let, let's go back. The surplus okay. didn't happen until the end, Into of, the the end of the administration. administration. Uh, and we're now talking about uh, the beginning. Uh, we were very lucky, actually, in the Clinton administration uh, to uh, inherit an improving economy. But we didn't know that at the time. Uh, the Clinton campaign was uh, based on uh, the now famous slogan, it's the economy, stupid. And by that we meant the economy is not in very good shape and we can make it better. Uh, actually, the economy was turning uh, in uh, 1992 and uh, improving. This uh, proves Mitch's point that you have to look very carefully uh, at the numbers. Uh, but uh, and the, also the uh, priorities uh, that were appropriate for a new administration were shifting. Uh, the president, like many presidents, uh, had uh, campaigned on uh, a middle class tax cut, uh, a very always a popular item, and uh, on a big infrastructure uh, program. And uh, he had said, yes, he wanted to be fiscally responsible, but he hadn't been very specific about it. Uh, but by the time he won, uh, and remember, there was a lot of attention to the deficit in the campaign, not so much from the Clinton camp, uh, but from Ross Perot. Uh, so people were beginning to think about uh, the problem of the deficit. And um, as we came in, uh, we were reassessing the, the numbers uh, and uh, realizing that if we didn't do something about the projected rising deficit, and I think those projections were realistic, uh, we would not be able to do much of anything else. And uh, part of the problem was interest rates were quite high then. And if the debt went up as fast as it would with the projected deficits, uh, we were going to be in trouble because of rising uh, debt service. Uh, so uh, reassessing all of that was very, was very sensible. Uh, we did do it. The economic team was appointed first. Um, and uh, I was fortunate to be on it. I was actually not the budget director. I was deputy, deputy to Leon Panetta. Uh, and uh, the Clinton administration was sort of playing at a parliamentary government. Uh, uh, we don't have a parliamentary government, and we learned very quickly as we took <laughs> office <laughs> that our constitution is separation of powers uh, and that you have to negotiate with the Congress, even if they're your own party. Uh, but uh, the idea was uh, if you brought in Leon Panetta, who had been budget chairman in the House for a long time, uh, and Lloyd Benson, who'd been Finance uh, Committee Chairman in the Senate, uh, and put them in positions of prominence, and there were actually even a couple of others, uh, then it would be easier to negotiate with the Congress. Uh, wrong. It's never easy to uh, negotiate with the Congress. Uh, a budget is inherently in our system a negotiation. Uh, in the Clinton administration for the first two years, we negotiated with our own team in the House, and believe me, it was hard. Our first budget did things that Democrats don't like to do, uh, like cutting spending, uh, domestic spending, uh, and uh, it uh, raised taxes, which nobody likes to do, uh, and getting that budget through uh, a Democratic House and, se and Senate uh, took arm twisting of the most uh, aggressive sort. Uh, it passed by one vote in each house. Uh, so I think the one, one lesson is reassess the numbers as soon as you come in and uh, think what you, whether what you did in the, what you advocated in the campaign is actually uh, possible. 
Uh, and uh, also, don't forget, uh, the important thing about our government is everything is a negotiation, especially the budget. Well, you make a, both make a terrific point. On one, you can't always trust the numbers that you see on the table in front of you. Um, you you've stolen my second question in talking about the members of Congress. I remember when uh, uh, Lloyd Benson was chosen by President Clinton to be Treasury Secretary, Lloyd Benson said as a Texan he could never pass up a job that had alcohol, tobacco, and firearms as a special agency within the Treasury Department. Um, Mitch, what did you do, or Mr. President, what, what did you do in, in, terms, in terms of dealing with Congress that first year? Remind me, was it a Republican Congress? It was a Democratic Congress. Divided Congress. The, the, the Senate had, had gone Republican. Yeah. And the, the House was still Democratic? Well, let me take that back. No, we had uh, actually, uh, he had carried them in. See, I told you I forgot a lot of things. And <laughs> something as trivial as that. Everything Alice said, I, I uh, uh, agree with. And uh, I, by the way, I, I should have spoken more precisely. The, de the, uh, the surpluses of 2000 and 1999, 2000, 2001 were real. What was illusory was the universal impression that they were not only going to continue, but even grow. Yes. And we all were wrong. Uh, I still remember, it's stunning to remember, but uh, uh, then um, Chairman Greenspan, among others, was talking about, gee, there, there's probably a limit to how much debt you should pay down because you'll take the liquidity out of the bond market. Now imagine that we were thinking about paying the debt down to a level where you had to worry about something like that. Imagine that from the vantage point of 19 trillion and rising. But um, uh, I guess you'd say that, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, uh, budget directors and sometimes people speak and, write, speak and write loosely about this, but they don't make budgets, they don't make priorities. You're a mechanic. You, uh, you work for the President of the United States, and uh, that's where um, uh, fundamental decisions are made, which then you endeavor to implement, either in budgets or in the approach to regulations or you have the stomach for it, trying to bring some degree of efficient management to the, the federal Leviathan. And um, so uh, I guess you would say that I played bad cop um, to an extent. I, I uh, was placed uh, uh, on the point of most, well, really all our negotiations, first on the tax cuts, uh, which was uh, you know, by the way, it's really, uh, one other point I want to leave, if just one other, is that uh, the unexpected will happen and things will change in perhaps in dramatic and violent ways, no matter what your priorities were, your budgets were, your hopes were coming in. And everybody knows what change happened in 01. But um, it's, it's, it's instructive to think back. That first Bush budget was about uh, tax cuts, which he'd run on, no Child Left Behind and Education Reform, which was, if anything, his greatest uh, passion at the time. And very modest reform of the military. In fact, the only thing, you know, so I, I ask him then, as in, in future years, what do you want the parameters of this budget to look like? And then we'll write the details and you can check off on those. And the only thing that the, that then President Bush had in mind for the military was modest pay increases to catch up. Uh, there was a sense that men and women in, in uh, uniform had uh, slipped behind. And what we, uh, he hoped would be the first elements of reforming, restructuring it for a less bilateral you know, world, all that. And uh, it, it, that all lasted 10 months, and then a whole new um, agenda was forced because, on the nation. Because of? The attacks, yeah. On September 11th. Um, Ms. Ruffin, um, you, you made an interesting point about uh, how you had to deal with your own folks uh, on Capitol Hill uh, first. You took uh, over the budget office on October 17th uh, of 1994. In a formal sense, I'd been acting director for uh, since June of that year, and I'd been there as deputy right. director. But it wasn't the, that date yeah. wasn't very significant. But 22 days after that, the uh, Republican Revolution took the House. Right. 
Was it easier dealing with uh, the Republican House budget system, or were, were your own Democrats the, the more difficult? I think in many ways it was easier dealing with the Republicans, not that it was pleasant. Uh. <laughs> at, at that moment, do you remember uh, Gingrich came in as the, the new leader of a revolution, and uh, he had a contract, and. Uh, uh, lots of things he thought he could accomplish all by himself. He learned also that he had to negotiate. <laughs> uh, and uh, the president, uh, having uh, lost badly in uh, 94, uh, was uh, quite, uh, the mood was, was depressed. Uh, on the other hand, the things that were going for uh, a, a bipartisan solution were that at that moment, we hadn't balanced the budget yet. Uh, we had passed a budget reduction package, which turned out to be the right one, but uh, we didn't know that for sure. Uh, the Republicans came in and said, we agree with your balance the budget objective, we just want to do it faster. Uh, and uh, so the negotiation was not about whether the deficit should come down, it was about how fast it should come down and what the components uh, should, should be. Uh, the Clinton administration wanted very much to protect the things it thought were very important, uh, especially uh, the environment and, uh, and education. Uh, and uh, the uh, Gingrich administration had different priorities. So, but it was a negotiation about priorities and not about the uh, ultimate uh, objective, which made it uh, easier. The thing that made the de negotiation with the Democrats in the first two years uh, hard uh, was uh, partly the uncertainty. Uh, <clears throat> when we came in, uh, although uh, Jared Bernstein says in his excellent piece that you're publishing, uh, that we came into a a, uh, a uh, improving uh, economy. We didn't know that. We thought it was quite fragile. And we did a confusing thing. Uh, we uh, crafted a budget reduction package, and we said, oh, by the way, we're worried that if we reduce the deficit too fast, we'll derail the recovery, so we're also going to have a stimulus package. That was a pretty confusing message uh, for anybody. The stimulus package we left largely to the Congress, and in the manner of the Congress, they added everything they could think of. <laughs> and it was a Christmas tree kind of, uh, kind of uh, bill. Uh, they added uh, midnight basketball. Midnight basketball is not a bad idea, but it sounded like wasting the government's uh, money. Uh, and the Congress um, said, we don't want to have anything to do with this. It just sounds gimmicky to us. Uh, that was not uh, a universal view. Many Democrats thought it was great. Uh, but uh, it, co it, it complicated the negotiation. In the end, they didn't pass the stimulus package. And they were right. Uh, we didn't need it. Uh, we could, the economy was strong enough to handle the deficit reduction without the stimulus. These are fascinating lessons. Did you want to jump in on that? Well, I'm just going to say that, uh, th thinking back, I mean, there's, it, 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 and this won't surprise you, Anne, that um, you've seen a lot of it, but there's a degree of stagecraft that goes into the negotiations with Congress, and sometimes the arguments and, with Congress, and sometimes it serves the interests, cer uh, certainly the congressional member, maybe both sides, to make it look like things are more contentious than they really are. You know, they're, they're showing off for the... You know, sometimes, the, but sometimes they really are. Yeah, sometimes they, well, I, yeah, they are. I mean, I, 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 we, um, uh, I'll give you the, for instance, that comes to mind. Uh, the, the late Senator Ted Stevens uh, was widely reported, you know, to have thought very little of me, and I just wasn't very reasonable, and, you know, should go home to Indiana and so forth. Well, um, uh, he and I had a back channel communication that was very vigorous, and we understood each other perfectly. He had some people he had to stand up for or show off for, his fellow appropriators, fans of this or that program. I got the joke. You know, he was, uh, he had worked for IBM early in his uh, career. I think that's where it started. Anyway, he was very, uh, he was a technophile. If he were still with us today, he'd be at the front edge of social media or something. 
<laughs> and uh, he was a very active emailer, uh, even in days when the technology was kind of primitive. And he, he and I had a, I've never talked about this before, but we had a, um, a separate channel just for communication between the two of us. And, and I, when he would, you know, call me names or criticize something I had said on behalf of the administration, I understood why he was doing it, tried to keep my sense of humor about it. And I'd like to, and I, and I think likewise, he understood that the president couldn't be out there um, criticizing his position or the position of others who wanted to spend more. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I was for, and I was expendable, so. We're gonna open this to uh, your questions in just a moment, but I wanna ask both of you, Washington doesn't just run on the White House and Congress. Um, much of Washington, especially when it gets to spending money, um, has a tremendous uh, pool of special interests. To what extent, as budget director, did you feel in, uh, under direct uh, uh, kind of targeting, target on your back, by uh, whether it's labor or business or the Chamber of Commerce or uh, environmentalists or uh, good government groups, to what extent did either of you feel um, uh, that kind of pressure and it make a difference? Alice? president uh, rather than on the OMB director, uh, but there were some things that uh, we didn't do because uh, uh, we knew that uh, the pressure would be there, uh, and the pressure was there. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, well, uh, one was uh, the, uh, oh, what's it called? The, uh, Corn for uh, uh, corn. Acorn. No. Uh, well, ethanol. 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 Sorry. Senior moment. Uh, uh, most of the economists, and I was one of them, uh, in uh, the administration, uh, thought that the ethanol program was really a bad idea. It still is. Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> but there was a lot of political steam behind it, uh, and uh, we never took that position. I would say, I would say that the, most of the pressure was indirect. They would use members of Congress to, uh, to get at you. You knew where it was coming from, but usually it was uh, uh, laundered through uh, some member of Congress that uh, you know, you'd want to be responsive to. I'd say the other thing, just speaking bluntly, in my case anyway, I didn't aspire to a career in this town. I wasn't going to go to work for anybody, you know. I wasn't going to go into a law firm that represented him. I wasn't going to go to work for one of those. I, I, I wanted to serve my sentence and be paroled, <laughs> and uh, that's what happened. So I, I, so I didn't pay much attention and didn't feel particularly aggrieved if if somebody on behalf of one of those uh, interest groups uh, took a shot. You know, the one thinking back, the one thing anybody remembers, I think, about our first budget. Maybe the only thing was that I had them put, uh, uh, you can't always get what you want on the hold button at, at OMB. Um, you know, the Rolling Stones song? <laughs> that lasted about maybe three days, right, Jim? And then the image makers in the White House decided that wasn't exactly what they wanted. So. Yeah. But I, you know, to an extent, I think you have to try to keep a little humor and a little perspective uh, that these fights, which on the page one of the post today just seem like life and death, you know, a few months from now, the action may have moved in some different direction or it wasn't quite so fundamental. On behalf of the press, you're welcome. <laughs> um, I'd love to open to questions, and if there are microphones that are coming around, real quickly as the, the microphone's coming in, and we'll start over here, let me ask quickly. Um, Mitch, you had a, uh, eventually, the administration was a wartime administration. Basically, your administration was not. Our wars, we Bosnia. Bosnia and Somalia early on, right. but that wasn't, uh, wasn't quite a war. Our wars fought off budget. Uh, how, how does the war funding, <laughs> did, uh, uh, Alice, for your, for your years uh, preceding the Bush administration, how did you pay for Bosnia? Oh, wars are not fought off budget. That's a myth. Uh, the, <laughs> and let me defend the, the Bush administration, the second one on this. Uh, they didn't fight the war off budget, meaning that the, nobody knew where the money was. 
uh, they didn't put in the budget the full amount for the fiscal year uh, because they argued they couldn't tell how yeah. much it was going uh, going to cost. So, uh, war, but let me tell one story about the budget. Uh, we had an action in Haiti uh, which required uh, additional uh, Navy operations down there. And it occurred uh, at the end of September. And uh, the, the end of the fiscal year, uh, and uh, we had to figure out how to pay for it because they were running up against the end of the fiscal year. Uh, and uh, uh, we did figure it out. We finagled a bit, but uh, and we actually found a Civil War statute uh, that <laughs> said that if you're in the middle, basically if you're in the middle of an action, a military action, uh, you just spend what you have to spend. Uh, and it's called the Food and Forage Act of uh, 1863, I think. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I remember saying to an admiral, if this ever happens again, admiral, please don't do it at the end of a fiscal year. <laughs> I remember going to uh, the National Press Club about a month after 9-11 and uh, uh, gave a speech I'd put some time and research into um, uh, and uh, had no effect at all, of course, but what I did was try to, I just historically illustrated that when the nation had gone to war before, priority shifted in a big way. Harry Truman cut the living daylights out of the domestic budget during the pendency of the Korean War, for instance, likewise in our previous conflicts, and suggested that that's what we ought to do again, that, that at least until the hostilities had been completed, that other things ought to have to wait their turn or be set aside, and Congress didn't want to hear that. And ultimately, uh, uh, you, you wouldn't find that much room was made in inside the budget for the, the costs that ensued. Um, the other thing well known to everybody in this room is, at least in those days, Congress just loves supplemental appropriations. So they may give speeches about, you know, this is bad practice, you ought to do it inside the budget, but oh boy, you know, bring a supplemental along because everybody gets to hang an ornament, or tries to. Tries to. And so some of the biggest scraps that I had in, in, in my time there were not over the budget itself, they were over uh, supplemental or uh, other, other tag-ons, uh, not so much over the substance of how much should be spent on war fighting uh, or the re recoveries of New York City or whatever we were funding, but uh, all the, um, let's say, uh, uh, peripheral items that uh, people I saw an opportunity to slide in there. Imagine yeah, that. Earthquake supplemental. Yeah. And you can't believe the things that people thought were related to this earthquake. <laughs> we're going to open the floor. They've got a question right here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joel Packer with the Committee for Education Funding and NDD United. My question is about what role do the cabinet members play um, in the budget, both in the development of the budget, how often do they try to sort of end run the OMB director to the president, and then once the budget's out, how much role do they play in negotiating with Congress or again trying to end run the president and the OMB director? Good question. Mitch? Great question, and I think you're gonna get a different answer based on every administration. I looked back at this a little bit. I'll just tell you our story. Um, um, my, my own view is, if a president chooses, and not all do, to empower OMB, it, it, can be, it can be an incredible uh, uh, saving of time and frustration and, and difficulty for the president. Now the MO in the Bush administration was, uh, I would take to him alternate trajectories for macro, at the macro level for spending and get some basic decisions. Now, I don't want spending to rise more than this, I'd like defense to do this, um, and I've got a couple fundamental uh, proposals we want to put in, there has to be room for those, just at that level. We'd come back with a fully detailed budget. I would list out for him what I thought were the big exposures, you, you know, we'd probably get criticized for the following 10 items and so forth, and then he'd bless it. And the system was that if a cabinet officer didn't like the number we took him, she or he could appeal to a little, uh, I said the appellate court, 
which was a little thing we jur jury rigged together, and it was chaired by the Vice President, Secretary of the Treasury, head of the Council of Economic, uh, or the Economic Council, I guess, Chief of Staff and me, I think that was five. And um, then, because every, we said every cabinet officer ought to have a right of final appeal, if they didn't like the answer they got there, they could go to the president. And in three years, nobody went to the president, which I thought was, I thought was a good thing. <laughs> I don't know what Tommy Thompson and some of those folks thought. They, they didn't like it as well. I think they felt if, that the president really wanted OMB to, to, to represent him, and if you couldn't get it past us, and you couldn't get it past this uh, Cheney in this appellate court, you were wasting your time. But we, we, the, the system was very clear. Any cabinet officer had a right to a one-on-one -on -one meeting, uh, if they didn't like the answer, but uh, at least in the three I participated in, um, the president was never bothered. Alice. Uh, we had a very activist president who liked to be part of budget making. Uh, and uh, in the first year was extremely active uh, in, in putting together the uh, budget uh, the budget package. We had hours of meetings with the president. Uh, but in uh, the regular budget making process, uh, we orchestrated meetings. Uh, we at OMB orchestrated uh, meetings in which uh, the cabinet members could appeal very important items. Uh, we also cheated a little because we held back some funds uh, uh, so that the president could, uh, after listening to these pleas, uh, uh, award uh, some additional uh, money. Uh, and uh, we would have uh, small group meetings, usually two or three cabinet officers uh, would come in. Uh, to the Oval Office and the OMB director would be there uh, and uh, make their uh, case against the, uh, the budget mark uh, and uh, we'd ask questions and the president wouldn't decide in the room. Uh, we would get together with him afterward and uh, he would say, uh, uh, and, and we would decide uh, sort of how to allocate the additional funds. So this is more of the good cop, bad cop uh, you let the president be the great decider. You let him be the you good guys. Take, yeah, absolutely. The, take the javelins for him. Right. Uh, question: Was there a second hand? Oh, it's way over here. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, um, I'm Paul Barton. I'm with TaxNotes.com. Uh, president Daniels, you uh, you were alluding to your bad cop function and you started to discuss, I believe, tax cuts. Uh, did you have reservations about the tax cuts that were enacted during the first term of George W. Bush? No, I really didn't. I, first of all, he had run on them quite openly, which is, I think, good practice. And I was, uh, my one tour in elected office, I was very fixed on that. Don't you know, play with the cards face up. Tell the public what it is you'll do, and then if they voted for you, you can go for it aggressively. And that, you know, he had campaigned openly on those. Um, they were, it was his decision. I didn't, uh, now looking back, and there, are many time, there are many things you can look back on, and I do, that say, uh-oh, that wasn't right. They, they were fine. You know, they, they were lucky fiscal policy. This was remarked at the time. One reason, I, th I think Dr. Rivlin would probably agree, that um, fiscal policy as stimulus has a spotty history. And one reason is, is that it's hard to get the timing right. By the time something's passed, and let's say tax changes, whether they're up or down or sideways, are in place, it's, uh, the, the economy's changed, it's moved on beyond that. So those tax cuts weren't designed it was accidental stimulus. They weren't really designed with that in mind, but the, the timing was pretty lucky, with it as, as, at least as I looked at it. They fell in and took effect at a time when it was probably of some use in, in speeding up the, and keeping that recovery shallow. But no, I mean, no, I didn't, I wasn't bothered or offended by them at the time. I thought it was our duty to go try to do what the candidate had pledged to do. And, um, you know, looking back, I think they, their uh, effects were, were, uh, were just fine. Alice? 
and Mitch is right that they weren't designed as stimulus, but they did work as stimulus. Uh, but what was unfortunate was the longer run. Uh, and as you projected out the effects of the tax cuts on anybody's numbers, you realized that we would have rising spending in the entitlement programs as the baby boomers retired and we weren't going to be able to afford those tax cuts. Uh, so uh, and then everybody knew that and the Congress knew that. So they said, okay, they'll expire at the end of 10 years. Now that was about the most unrealistic thing that has ever uh, happened in a, uh, a budget uh, and it caused no end of trouble. Back here, there's a, a young lady in red. Good morning, Jennifer Poulikidis with the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. Um, looking forward to this next presidency, what recommendations would you all make to the new president and her or his OMB director in tackling the major, major budget problems we're, we're currently suffering under? St uh, rank some priorities there that you would uh, would flag for the next team? Yes, uh, I would say uh, be sure uh, to include in your budget things that will uh, in, uh, invest in uh, the future productivity of the economy, but also remember that you've got a structural long-term deficit looming at you, coming sooner uh, than uh, you, uh, one might think, and that uh, we have to adjust taxes and entitlement programs, and it takes a long time, especially for entitlement programs, to any, for any changes to take effect. So a re fiscally responsible administration uh, should take that on uh, immediately. Uh, and uh, the most important and immediate, I think, is putting the social security system, which all older people depend on, or almost all, uh, on a firm fiscal foundation, uh, which at the moment it is not. It's not very hard to do. It's not a big deal. And it should have bipartisan support. But it's very important. Why doesn't it have this bipartisan support? Well, it did back in the days when Reagan was <laughs> negotiating with Tip O'Neill. <laughs> and that was a positive for Alan Greenspan, by the way. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it should have again, uh, but uh, presidents uh, yeah. haven't uh, taken it on uh, in, in that way. Uh, George, uh, uh, George Bush did. Uh, uh, look at Social Security, but he t had such a, uh, a proposal, so, un uh, so unrealistic uh, and uh, such uh, an offense to Democrats that it was never going to fly. No, that's typically well said. I, uh, I would say uh, uh, that I would hope that the heart of a new um, uh, proposal would be a full-throated pro-growth package because um, uh, everyone should understand that we cannot possibly, we can't make a meaningful first step toward, uh, toward a responsible future for the ne for next generations. It doesn't include a lot more revenue, and you cannot possibly get more revenue at one and one point something percent growth. I don't care what else you do. There's nowhere you can take tax rates. There's no other change you can make. It's going to you know, squeeze the lemon for uh, more revenue. So uh, one can harbor the hope that people who disagree strongly about other things would just recognize that arithmetic reality and might come together around a package, you know, surely. Every, you know, economists, as far as I can tell, of almost every stripe agree that lower, flatter rates, that, you know, if they generate, you want them to generate more revenue over time, that that might be a place to start and some point of common agreement. And then some first step on the biggest question, the one we haven't dealt with here, the one that presidential campaigns are studiously trying not to deal with, the monstrous problem of the so-called entitlement programs. Uh, when I looked back, when uh, I had that assignment, I mean, since I had that assignment, uh, about 10% has shifted from the discretionary to the non-discretionary side of the budget. 
and my friend Jennifer from Land Grant University, every other group in this town that is interested in discretionary spending should be leading this charge because there's not a chance of more money for your favorite program while the uh, autopilot programs are squeezing the life out of the, the budget we have. You know, what is it, two years from now, uh, they plus defense and interest will eat all the revenues and we'll be borrowing every penny we spend on education or all these other priorities. So I, the United States is a very lucky country. The world chooses to use our currency and, uh, and right now, in a staggering world economy, we're, we're the safe harbor, we're the best house in a slum neighborhood. And if we'll just get started, it's already too late to, quote, fix the problem. But the world will bridge finance this country in a way it wouldn't somebody else. And it, but we've got to get started. So as Alice says, there's a lot of things you can do that ought to bother no one. We could quit over-indexing. You can protect people's income. You don't have to over-index when you're broke, and that's what we do. You could raise the in retirement rage, rage, uh, age prospectively to catch up a little bit with actuarial realities and lifespans, et cetera. And uh, of course, you, you sh we shouldn't be sending pension checks to Warren Buffett and all that. So I mean, there are things you could do that would begin to inform the public who has been actively misinformed for decades about these programs and how solvent they are and how they work. We've got to start down the trail as a democracy of, of leveling with people. And I hope, that, I, hope that, I hope the next budget statement by somebody will at least take that first step. I agree with that, but I want to mention one more problem, which is a, a very high priority, and we need to make a start on it, and that's climate change. Uh, and while we're looking at tax systems, uh, we should have a very small but increasing over time carbon tax of some sort. Uh, don't make the mistake that the Clinton administration did and call it a BTU tax. That was a terrible idea. <laughs> uh, British. Uh, uh, but uh, call it what it is, uh, it should be a, a discourage the use of fossil fuels over time. We have time for a couple more questions. And there's one right, way here in the back. Yeah. Any over here? Good morning. My name is Max Trujillo with a consulting firm of Tony Burgos and Associates. From, from time to time, there's always a discussion whether it's, and I want to ask you whether there is, there is wisdom or folly in the debate on whether or not Congress and the executive should do two-year budgets. Is it better for, from the executive point of view, to do an analysis for two years and does it provide Congress the opportunity to do better oversight in a two-year process? Whether or not it can be done or not, I just wanted to see if that's an idea that should be explored more fully. Thank you. Let me start with Mitch on that. Did you do a two-year budget in Indiana? Yes, and it's better. I mean, I do think it's a good idea. And uh, for the reasons that, that you gave, and uh, um, uh, it, it, was, it was far superior. Um, I thought, to be able to deal with it on a biennial basis and, and plenty of other things to work on, and uh, this would leave more space to do so. I agree with that. I don't know if you realize you've got two Hoosiers here, so. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> Bloomington, right? Yes. Uh, so uh, I, I believe that a uh, two-year budget would be a, a good thing for the federal government. Uh, but it doesn't, uh, it's not a panacea. It, uh, unlike a state where the budget uh, covers just about everything, uh, here, where you're talking about discretionary spending appropriations for two years, uh, you're only talking about a small part of the budget. And we have to find a way of reviewing the ongoing entitlement programs and uh, spending in the tax code on a regular basis, not necessarily a two-year basis, but on a regular basis. In, in, and institutionalize that. Sorry. And institutionalize that uh, in, in, uh, in some way. Uh, because right now the budget process, uh, which we, <laughs> which is very broken, uh, but it deals only with uh, discretionary spending, which is about a third of the budget, and not the part that's increasing, as Mitch has said. Was there? Uh, you have one. Right here. Okay.
should all agree that there's some radical restructuring that's necessary to play out during the campaign, particularly as well. I think a lot of resistance there has to do with the lack of community. I think the whole social part of that has to do with it. My question is very specific about OMB. What would you do to restructure OMB to make sure that it's ready to deal with a lot of these issues? It has very few economists. It doesn't model things. It doesn't put out option papers. I remember one deputy secretary of the Treasury once saying they didn't deal with something because the CEO had to put out a paper. I'm wondering what internal to OMB needs to be done to restructure it to be ready for the types of reform you're talking about. Start with Alice on that. When we came into OMB uh, in uh, 93, uh, we did do a restructuring, uh, futuristic, we called it OMB 2000. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. And it was an attempt to bring the management functions and the budget functions together. Uh, I think we did a pretty good job. I don't know of any restructuring that OMB really uh, needs at the moment. I think you did a good job, too. I, I, I was a big fan. I, I'm well removed by now. There may be some improvements that, that would make sense, but um, uh, the, I thought the finest professionals I met in the whole federal government yeah. were in OMB. It's a very good set. You know, oh, it's terrific. And uh, I, I used to say if, 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 if you have a narrow view or if, you, or if you just want the government to be bigger and more, more expansive and expensive, there's a whole town full of buildings you can go to work in. If you want the government to be smarter, you come to work at OMB, and, and I thought uh, this, both the structure you left behind, Alice, and, and, the, and the individuals were just superb. It was a real privilege to work with them every day. How much of your staff is professional, career staff? You bring, obviously, in the top layer, but uh, your, your uh, confidence in the, in the abilities of those who are kind of the institutional career members of the uh, Office of Management and Budget. The layer in OMB is not very deep. I mean, you, really? you bring in the uh, director and the deputy, two deputy directors, and a low uh, and a level called CADs, uh, program associate directors, uh, uh, and that's it. And the rest, uh, the is, rest is professional staff. Yeah, I think we were total of around 550, 560, something like that, and. I think maybe 25, all told. You know, you have some people who work on, uh, oh, uh, the, the public uh, communications yeah. and a few jobs like that. Uh, but I, I'm just going to say again, I, I thought it was civil service at its finest. They served. They, they were. They were. Uh, uh, in my experience, they were fully. Uh, they would fully align with whatever priorities the, the then president had chosen, and um, I, I was. Uh, it, it's, it's so easy, it's too easy, you know, to say just sarcastic things about our federal government. It deserves them on many occasions. <laughs> but I'll tell you, the people at OMB uh, are, are at least the exception that, prove, that proves the rule. They were, they were terrific, and uh, I'd, I'd gladly work with them again. Well, They're right I, across the street. I hope they are hearing this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have one kind of final question for you both, because it's right there in the, in the headlines today. One of the Republicans running for president says he will wipe out the $19 trillion debt in eight years. Why couldn't you do that? I'll tell you a secret. He can't do it either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mitch, it's your party. <laughs> well, well, you understand, I, as I always say, I took a vow of political celibacy on the day <laughs> took my new job. So no, it's not. But uh, no, that's a ridiculous statement, of course. And, and uh, um, you know, and again, it, it may be a little extreme, but unfortunately, it's hard to find a candidate for national office in either party for quite some time who has spoken seriously and in an adult fashion to the American people about this. You cannot blame the American people for believing the, the uh, um, you know, what is, what is frankly untrue about the fix we're in, about its dimension, about where it comes from, about what it will take to, to change that. I don't know very many people uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in their adult years who knowingly would plunder their children, but they don't know that that's what we're doing. And uh, sooner or later, it will help when people stop making a lavish promises that can't possibly be uh, met, but it sooner or later, and hopefully before the uh, 
catastrophe forces us to, uh, we'll start to talk about a few common sense things that can get us started on the path back. You know, Alice and her colleagues left behind a really strong situation for this country. And we can differ about um, how, how much of it was you know, not going to happen as we hoped and, and which policies made things a little worse, but far and away the ones that have put us in the soup we're in have to do with that two-thirds of the budget that uh, we treat as though it were untouchable and it cannot stay that way. With it, and perhaps maybe the media should uh, do a better job of covering it as well, but that's a subject of yet another conference. <laughs> Our thanks, please, for Alice Rivlin and Mitch Daniels. Thank you. And my thanks to Ann Compton, who is the master at this, and we're so lucky and, and blessed to have her uh, as part of the Miller Center team in, in so many different capacities. Uh, and I wanted to thank a few other people right before we take a quick break. We'll take a break of about 20 minutes and start again at 11 o'clock uh, with a panel that looks at some of the essays that were done for this volume, um, including one by our great partner, Maya McGinnis at the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. And I want to start by thanking them. I, I think what you see, particularly with Mitch, as a, um, with Mitch and Alice, both having been involved with, C with um, CRFB, I always stumble over the acronym, um, uh, this, uh, the, the values and structure uh, of that organization and our organization, the Miller Center, are identical. We're both nonpartisan and bipartisan. We work with uh, people in both parties who have served in government. The Miller Center has done the official oral history of every presidential administration going back to uh, part of the Ford administration and then also the uh, full one on the Carter administration and uh, the network of former officials that makes up the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget um, are, are part of our alumni association. So we're really delighted that we are really in many ways overlapping organizations. So great thanks there to our staff particularly um, Reed Forbes and Tony Lucadano and Jeff Chittister and everybody else who I haven't named, uh, Howard Witt and the communications team. Uh, th these, doing these events off-site for us are a little bit extra work, but they're a lot more fun, um, including getting to come to this, this great place. And I also in particular want to thank governing council members who are here. Uh, I see Judy Hope and Suzanne Whitmore, and I may be missing one or two. Um, and, and of course, Ann Compton and, and other friends who have joined us. And, um, and last, to the Kaplan family, this is the Kaplan conference that we do every year. It's often on the global economy, but this year I think they and we felt uh, that addressing the budget challenges were so important. So we're really delighted um, that, uh, that this Kaplan conference could be de dedicated to this. We will take a short break and come back with our next panel at 11 o'clock. Please help yourself to, um, uh, to muff muffins and biscuits and other coffee and other things that are in the back that my daughter is protecting from all of you and she's going to step out of the way and let you get at them. So thank you. <laughs>